Hi, I'm Jeff. I'm Director of Technology and Digital Initiatives here at Vizcaya Museum and Gardens. And uh, welcome to Vizcaya, and also welcome to Preservation Month. Uh, it's May 1st, that May is Preservation Month. So, um, you know, we, we have a little bit of a preservation story here at Vizcaya, uh, in case you don't know. And we're actually in one of our uh, most endangered places at Vizcaya in terms of preservation. We're going to take you on a, a little bit of a tour of that. Uh, using kind of a technology lens because we're bringing technologies to bear on the preservation issues that we have in the space. Um, the first thing I want to do is uh, tell you a little bit about a website where you can actually get in here and explore virtually the swimming pool grotto where we currently are. It's at virtualviscaya.org. Again, that's virtualviscaya.org. If you get in there, you can actually uh, Kind of get an immersive experience. We even have the ability for you to use Google Cardboard, a VR headset, and uh, if you use the link on that page, you can get in there and actually feel like you're in the space a little bit. So um, I'm going to start with just kind of give you an introduction to what the Swing Pool Grotto is. In the future, we're going to have uh, another one of these live sessions with this guy's former conservator, Lauren Hall who uh, has done a lot of preservation work and stabilized this space uh, over the past few years with partners like University of Pennsylvania. So uh, excited, she's got all the scoop on everything that's happened in this space. That's going to be really, really cool. Um, so the grotto here, the, in particular the ceiling, was um, done by an artist named Robert Winthrop Chandler. Uh, what it, this is, is kind of a fantastical sea scene. And it's got fish, and it, it's got um, the, the flora, the sea flora. It's got, a, a lot of it's done in relief. So, you know, you've got something that in its day must have been exquisite. Um, a lot of the original paint, especially on the fish, was kind of metallic. So as you had the sun coming through the archways here, it hit the light, it would dapple up and reflect on those metallic paints. Now, as you're looking at it, you see it's not so much the case anymore. You can hardly tell what the detail is at this point, and that's because uh, Chandler used water's soluble paints. So you've got, you know, the heat of Miami, uh, very high temperatures. You've got the natural humidity here. We're on the bay, uh, and then you have a swimming pool right below it. So with all of these factors in play, water soluble paints were not going to hold up. Uh, as a result, it's been a tremendous preservation challenge just to keep this area stabilized. And over the years before the sky really developed a preservation and conservation ethic, um, a lot of uh, well-meaning, well-intentioned folks uh, attempted to repair it you know, with questionable results. So a number of times there were overpaints done in this space. Um, you know, the overpaints, you know, they were not the same type of paints, not the same colors. Uh, one of the preservation projects that uh, Lauren undertook previously was to get a team in here to look at the layers of paint and try to find what those originals were. So um, that's one of those things we're evaluating. We're not trying to restore the space, we're preserving it, we're stabilizing it, we're trying to keep things as much uh, as they can be as they are. Um, and then, you know, in the future, we we're working on like just stabilizing, for example, the ceiling, some of the heat issues we have with the heat being trapped above the ceiling and causing additional problems. So we're mitigating in that way. I'm gonna point out a few of the features here at the, uh, the grotto. First one, kind of the central sculpture. We have the cherub uh, here, and this is a leg sculpture. And it was originally a fountain. It hasn't worked as a fountain in quite a while, but um, still an interesting piece. Next, I'm going to point out the fountains. We have two of them. Uh, this guy was built with the principle of symmetry in mind, so there, there, uh, there is balance amongst all of the architectural elements. We have two fountains here, pretty much the same. Uh, these haven't worked in a while, but could be preserved in the future. We have the funding to do it. Uh, when they were built, 
these fountains would have provided, uh, you know, airflow. They would have uh, cooled this area down because obviously there's not a lot of airflow in uh, kind of a trapped grotto type of situation. You can see also that there are shells all around the wall. These were done in the same symmetrical fashion as the architectural elements. Someone really quick asked, uh, Jose asked, is it empty? Um, the pool is my favorite part. By empty, do you mean with water? There is water in the pool right now, if you can see. Don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, generally, there is water here. Now, we had a question um, on Instagram about, you know, do people actually swim here? And a lot of visitors who come to Vizcaya ask that question too. Do you, do you ever, the staff just get in there and uh, swim sometimes? And the answer is no. Uh, we haven't done that. Um, but, you know, an interesting little factoid is that going through our archival photos, We've actually never even seen pictures of people in this space. So if you look historically from James Deering's time, there's all types of photographs for magazines and things like that, but the grotto is always empty. We've never seen evidence of a person actually using the swimming pool. Another question. Um, Susie asked, did Chaffin design this as well? I, I don't know that. So, um, and sorry, this is Alex speaking. I'm the digital communications manager at Vizcaya, so I know random facts from what I post on social media. Um, and I'm gonna step back and take my mask off real quick. Um, so as far as I know, uh, Chaffin had a hand in designing like this portion of it, like the, the archways and uh, the floor, the, the shell designs. Um, but the mural itself was Robert Winthorpe Chandler. And I, I bet you, knowing uh, Chandler's person, uh, Chalfin's personality, that uh, you know there were some ground rules laid for how it would look, and they definitely probably had numerous discussions about that. Uh, one of the projects that we're doing right now is evaluating letters and correspondence from James Hearing and Paul Chalfin in the building of Iskaya. We're going to digitize those and make those into a mobile experience. People can explore those letters. Uh, but, you know, every detail of Vizcaya was discussed at length, and this is in a time where people actually uh, wrote letters about things. So multiple letters a day between the designers, the, the, the artists, uh, and Deary. So I want to point out another architectural detail here. And this is an area where the interactive that I told you about at virtualvisky.org really shines. Uh, these are alligators, and you can see they're in relief. Um, but if you're, unless you're really close up to it, you're standing back from it, the peeling paints and the discoloration, uh, it kind of, you, you can't really tell what they are. So what we did in this space, because of all the preservation issues, is. Uh, Laura and I worked together on getting the space 3D documented. So we used a technology called 3D laser scanning, which is commonly used in preservation, um, to map the space. We had a camera that had uh, a laser beam inside of it. It would shoot out lasers. It would map the entire surface of this space. So what that allows us to do from a preservation standpoint is if we repeatedly do that, we can overlay the data between those, uh, those two models, point clouds, and then we can see if there are micro cracks developing in the space, things that are invisible to the naked eye, but allow us to proactively address those issues before they become really big ones. Now, we had funding from the Knight Foundation uh, a couple years ago to be able to take those preservation quality scans and make them accessible to the public. And we, what we did is we, you know, these three laser scans are point clouds, lots of little dots, they're not naturally just 3D models that you can explore, but we developed a, a way to uh, models from them that you can explore on the website. Also, um, there's a, a kiosk here in the museum, large screen kiosk, where you can manipulate those models. And we're going to continue to do that. We're, what we're trying to do is uh, basically 3D document the entire estate. Okay, sorry, Susie asked another question. Was this sculpted in plaster or concrete? 
plaster is what I believe. Right. So um, maybe the underlaying structure is poured concrete like the rest of the estate. That's very likely. But all of the relief sculptures, all of the design work, other than the actual seashells, right, all of this is just plaster. That's right. Which is also, you know, not the best um, uh, material to hold up to humidity and heat. So in regards to the alligators, what you can do is that you can actually zoom in on these in the interactive online and see those little dots where I was telling you about the map, the surface, you can see each of the dots and this is not going to show up so well here but what you get a better sense of are the contours of the sculpture. So you can see the mouth, um, you can see it becomes really 3D there and you can tell a little bit better what these figures are, that they are alligators in spite of the fact that you know you've got the peeling paint and the discoloration up on the ceiling. Now, there's one other little detail uh, I want to mention. In 2017, Hurricane Irma came through, and this is one of the areas that was affected. Now, this has probably been flooded numerous times with hurricanes over the last hundred years. Uh, it was built to withstand them, this guy, you know, and those letters that I was talking about with James Deering and Paul Chalfin, they were considering hurricanes and the effects of those and how to, to build uh, you know, sustainably with this land and, and make the, the sky last. Uh, but there was one little area that was affected in this last hurricane, and it's right down here at the bottom. Uh, it, it was just a, a weak area in the wall, and though this, we have the strong doors that were meant to keep water out when it, we have the storm surge, there was a weak area here in the wall that uh, water was able to work its way through, and the, so those floodwaters got into the basement and did quite a bit of damage here at this guy. Now you can see, you can see through this window, uh, this was our former cafe, and it was badly damaged. We had, I think, about five feet of water in there, uh, standing water. So it is being restored. We're getting this area back up to spec, and we're going to keep continuing to do that. And we could actually use your help in these activities with preservation. So, you know, you know, it's expensive to preserve Vizcaya and we've got a lot of unique situations, materials to deal with. Um, you know, there's expertise that we have to contract to help us with some of this. We'd like to, as I said, really document the entire estate so that we have a record that is uh, useful for our preservation efforts, but also helps to make that estate accessible to you in 3D models. Um, and, you know, the only way we can do it is with your support. So in Preservation Month, we will hope that you'll go to Vizcaya.org slash donate, and um, you can give online to, to help these efforts. I appreciate you being with us today. Um, hope to see you again in the future.